You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. This week is a bit of a musical edition. We are sharing some music at the end of the episode, so make sure you listen along to the whole thing. I'm speaking to a, an artist today, a musician, a singer, a guitar player, a gentleman who is really breaking out recently with his music, and uh, I think you're going to love it. But more importantly, we're going to dig into his story and he's going to share some amazing insights from his life and really what inspired him to go on and write about what he does in his songs. Very cool. We will step into that momentarily. Before we do so, you can get yourself a copy of The Anxiety Journal over at theanxietyjournal.com. Uh, for everything else, go to anxietypodcast.com. You can get my free five-week course. You can get my end anxiety toolkit and you can find out more about the other things I do the one-on-one coaching the workplace wellness retreats and everything else if you want to be part of the more uh more the less anxiety more life facebook group there's a button for that on the website as well would love to see you in there and kind of share people's experience and what they're up to so Let's talk about this week's guest. So Leroy Stagger, he even has a bloody cool name, this man. He's so cool. And he's got a massive beard, so he's got everything you need. Um, he's a singer-songwriter. His latest album is called Love Versus. It just came out recently. It's on iTunes. Make sure you buy it. Download some songs. They are fantastic. We're going to share one with you today. But we get into everything, talking about everything from Buddhism to alcohol to self-love, um, to music, obviously, to Leroy's upbringing and kind of some of the things which formed him uh, as a man and gave him some context which of which to push against and create the music he's created. So he's been doing this for a while and I love it when you see somebody and, and it seems like they're just breaking out, but as we talk about, he's 15 years in the making as far as music goes. Um, and I have to, I have to be honest, this conversation went in some places I wasn't expecting. We get kind of deep and he shares some interesting anecdotes about how when he started to let go of the music and, and started to make it about other people, it really started to take off. So cool stuff. And without further ado, let's chat to Leroy. Okay. So Leroy Stagger, welcome to the anxiety podcast. That's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. I think you're our first professional recording artist that we've had on the show. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, anxiety comes in all forms and uh, and uh, tr- professions, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. And I think um, I always remember growing up listening to Green Day, thinking there was a lot of darkness going on in those songs, obviously, <laughs> based on the lyrics. But um, yeah, that would be somebody else to try and get on one day. Yeah, I um I also grew up uh with those records too. Um I I think Dookie was like a pretty seminal mm. record for my for my youth. How old are you? Uh how old am I? 34. Okay. Yeah, you're a little yeah. younger than me, but similar yeah. similar era. Yeah. And you grew up in Canada in British Columbia, is that right? Yeah, I grew up um was born in Victoria and kind of grew up Along, you know, like Duncan, Mill Bay, Couch and Bay, along the right. uh, up in the island there. In the hood. Yeah. Yeah, not far so, from you. Yeah, maybe a good place to start, uh, Leroy, is, is kind of talking us through your, your formative years and your upbringing. Because I know a lot of your music is inspired by your own experience with anxiety and depression and kind of what happened to you. So maybe you could walk us through that a bit. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I grew up... Um, like I said, up Island, uh, Vancouver Island. And, um, my parents, they were, I mean, I don't ever remember them being together. Um, so I was raised with, uh, raised with my dad. Um, so my mom, you know, wasn't around much. I'd see her maybe once every couple months kind of deal. And it's not like we had a bad relationship or anything like that. It's just, we just didn't, you know, I didn't see her too much. Um, and uh so growing up with my dad he he married uh remarried and um there was like a lot of 
I guess a lot of abuse in the house. Um, you know, a lot of physical and mental abuse going on when I was a kid. Um, and then they had a child together and, um, he, uh, was, was killed actually in a really tragic accident, which just did not, you know, not help the, uh, the situation at home. Um, so, you, so my, my formative years were pretty, uh, pretty crazy, you know, pretty, pretty manic and, um, you know, just kind of one of those things that I, I just couldn't wait to grow up and, and kind of move on. Um, and I kind of spent a lot of time, thankfully, actually with my grandparents, they were kind of my saving grace. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with them, especially when my dad divorced from his wife. Um, and, uh, so I spent a lot of time with them and, and that was good cause they were, you know, they were great and they were super loving and, and, uh, but, uh, you know, kind of around like 14, 15, I guess, maybe 13 to 15, I, I discovered alcohol and started drinking and, and realizing that, uh, you know, I could kind of get out of my head that way. And, um, so I kind of started drinking about 13 and, and, uh, and, you know, there wasn't any really any parental figures around too much to kind of monitor that. And, you know, it late, it became a problem later on in my life. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I just kind of went through my youth and up until my mid twenties trying to escape, uh, escape my, myself, I guess, for, for lack of a better, better term, um, and then one day I woke up and I realized that I just kind of was pushing through life and, and not, uh, not dealing with my past. And, um, it all kind of came to a head when I had my first, my first child, uh, about four years ago. And I realized that I really, really needed to deal with it. And, and, uh, it all kind of came to the surface. And for me to actually stop and take a look, look at it, it all kind of came out then. And so did you, when you were kind of growing up, did you recognize it as you, you thinking of yourself as an anxious person or were you just, just generally scared as, as we are yeah. When kids? Yeah, I think it was just mostly based in fear. I don't think I ever stopped and, um, and kind of tried to, uh, look at it, you know, from the outside and this and see what it was. Um, I remember, I, I, I remember having, uh, I mean, I've always, you know, suffered from depression my whole life. Um, but I remember having a, an anxiety attack when I was probably 19 and never really, I didn't even, you know, again, just didn't stop to think of, oh, that was strange. You know, I just kind of plowed through and, and tried to leave it behind. Um but it wasn't, yeah, like it wasn't until, you know, I turned, well, I got sober when I was 25. Um, and, you know, I went through a program and that really helped to kind of, kind of ditch the ego a bit, you know? Um, and I think kind of seeing, you know, seeing that my ego for what it was, was helpful. But it wasn't until I was, you know, 31 when I started getting therapy, then realizing that, you know, that I actually was had, you know, have been suffering from depression. And um, like most people, I think I hit a wall uh, where I just got so tired. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it anymore. And um, I wanted a, a cure all, you know, and that's why I went to uh, to therapy. And of course, you know, there really isn't there isn't really a a silver bullet or a cure all for this, but uh, therapy, you know, change just got set me off on a path that, you know, changed my life for the better. And the getting sober at 25 was the, like a, a big event that made you finally say like enough's enough time to change. Yeah. I mean, nothing like there was, there was a, you know, a multitude of events that kind of just a chain reaction of things that, I think I just had a bit of a, a mental breakdown. I'd been on the road for a couple months and I was really driving it into the, into the ground as best as I could. Um, and there was like, it was almost like there was like these little voices on my shoulder, you know, this one, there's like this little voice 
in my ear that just kept saying like, Oh, it's the booze, you know, it's the booze. And, uh, I was driving home, uh, from a big tour and, you know, long prairie drives kind of give you that time to reflect. And, um, I just phoned my, my, uh, girlfriend at the time who's now my wife and, and said, you know, I, I think I need to take a break from drinking. And, um, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't totally surprised, but, uh, so, I got, I was sober on my own will for about a month. And then I, uh, went to Scotland to tour there. And as soon as the plane touched down, it was like, all right, we're in the, you know, we're in the land of really good scotch and, uh, you know, had another couple months of drinking and, uh, finally was in the right place at the right time and, uh, ended up going to a meeting and, and, you know, I've been, I haven't touched booze since and that's been almost 10 years. Well, congratulations for that. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that like in, in your business, the drinking culture is still very prevalent, right? Like it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Like you're playing in pubs, you're playing in bars. I mean, before people make it, I'm sure a lot of the time they just get paid with like have a few drinks while you play kind of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I do wonder how much of that whole lifestyle played into, you know, my alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And I I definitely, um, don't think it, you know, I don't think it helped. And so how do you, how do you tackle that today when you walk into a club or, uh, venue to play in and there's kind of alcohol around? Is it, is it something that you kind of consciously have to just stay away from? Do you leave straight after the show? Like, how do you, what's your routine around that? Well, it's not an issue for me at this point in my life. Um, I, you know, I drink non-alcoholic beer here and there. Um, and that took me about seven years just to even get to the point where I was, uh, you know, uh, not afraid to do, to even just try that, you know, but, um, I don't know. It's like, there, it's fine for me. You know, it's like I've, I've moved on and I've, I've kind of healed from the things that, uh, you know, from my past and, and it's just not an issue anymore. You know, when I first started um, getting sober and I remember going to a, a therapist and uh, I explained it to her that it was, she, she asked me what it was, you know, what's going on. And I felt, and I, I, I straight up felt there was a literally a void, a big black hole right where my heart was. And, um, and then, you know, working with her, I re- you know, I realized it was yeah, a lot of, you know, father issues. And, um, and we, you know, through some, through some, uh, some processes and stuff that, that helped and that void kind of disappeared. And did you ever did, uh, kind of stage fright, was that ever a thing for you or you always find kind of pregame nerves before you go on stage? Well, I mean, I think it's all kind of relative, you know, the just anxiety and depression, um, I think if you're anxious, an anxious person, you're kind of, I kind of feel like I was anxious or some form of depressed or self-conscious, uh, most times, you know what I mean? So there was never any like crippling stage fright, but, um, mostly I think for the most part, it was just not really being comfortable in my own skin. Um, so never really feeling comfortable on stage. And I think that was, uh, the biggest, probably the biggest hindrance of my, my career up until, you know, until I got really got help, which was about, you know, two or three years ago. Yeah. I think that's like a, an, an interesting line in the sand or an interesting definition. Cause you've been, you talk about, it's not debilitating, so you can still play and you can still sing and you still probably sound fine, but to actually, yeah. to actually be there and be like totally relaxed as in like, I'm in my happy place. I know that these people like me, I'm welcomed, I'm safe and this is all good. That's another evolution. It's another step. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, could you imagine 10 years of my career, I was up on stage thinking that people were judging me when realistically, you know, looking back is no, those people were paying money to see you, to see me play, you know, to hear my songs and to hear my art. And right. think, you know, looking back from the outside, looking in, it's just like how, how foolish to, for me to sit there and, and think that they were judging me or, or, you know, 
criticizing me that whole time. And it's just so absurd to me now. Yeah. The irony is they actually want you to do well. Yeah, they're, exactly. They're not, they're, they're not, you know, they're not paying money to be there to watch me fail. No, they're cheering you on. Yeah. It's but, funny whenever, um, whenever, when I ever watch bands live and, uh, it's, it's kind of raw and there's like a wrong note or something in, in some way, because I'm, uh, a failed aspiring recreational guitarist i'm like good they're not perfect <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and that's the beauty of it you know the music that i like is is not perfect so yeah so on the music tangent what age did you did you start kind of picking up an instrument or realizing that you had something well i mean i didn't I've, it's not like i was raised with i was raised with music but never really uh raised with mu- musicianship um and I didn't, it wasn't until I was, I mean, I played in punk rock bands when I was, you know, 17, uh, to my early twenties, but it wasn't until I was, you know, I think about 19 or 20 when I decided to pick up guitar and, and decided that I wanted to, you know, be more of a singer songwriter as opposed to just a screaming punk rocker. Um, cause I felt like I had something to say and I, and I, and really, I guess it, it was more or less, um, a subconscious way of, of, uh, of healing, you know, of, of putting my past to paper and just kind of, and, you know, exercising that cathartic experience. I don't, I never really thought about it until right now, but I mean, I imagine that's a big part of it, you know, and as I've grown in, into my career, I think what it is now is that I want to help people that, uh, that are suffering, you know, and that's, that's what I want to do through my music now. Um, but you know, like most kind of people like starting out as singer songwriters, it was pretty kind of diary rock, you know, heartbreak stuff at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk about, um, the inspiration behind your current album in a minute or some of the particular songs on there. Cause uh, yeah. I think it's very relevant to this audience, but yeah, I think it, and a really interesting point you made there is we often in a different way in my life, anxiety was crippling because I was trying to keep it a secret. And I realized that through sharing it, through talking about it to friends, to family, to putting it on Facebook, to some extent that vulnerability lifted some of the weight off my shoulders. So I think your creative endeavor through your songwriting, first of all, it it's some serious fuel because there's a lot of emotion tied to it. Um, yeah, but also it, it it allows you to, you know, be vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, people, people, I think people, um, appreciate vulnerability. Um, especially this day and age, people appreciate truth. And, you know, looking back at a lot of, you know, I feel like I may, I've made 11 records and I'd say probably nine of them, we're all kind of for me, you know what I mean? In a lot of ways. And and I don't think, I don't think that my career really started to open up and, and really see success until I kind of ripped open those, those, um, you know, those, those presents and, and just decided to, to give it to other people, you know what I mean? Instead of attaching the stories to myself, I wanted to, I wanted other people to relate to them and um, more than ever, you know, now when I go on tour, there's so many people that come up to me uh, privately and share their story. And um, I've become, I guess, kind of a, I guess just a go-to for people to, you know, to bounce ideas or to share the, uh, their stories of their depression and their anxiety and their alcoholism or, or, you know, their abuse. And, um, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with, I want, I want to hear people's stories and I want to, you know, offer what worked for me. Um, and if that can help in, in, you know, a little, a little way, I mean, that just kind of gives so much more meaning to what I do. And it's kind of exactly what I needed, you know, at this point, my, my life and my career. Yeah. And I think to your earlier point, uh, uh, and I've heard this a lot, it's certainly been my experience for the first long time. My challenges in my life made me very introspective. So it was, I was constantly walking around the world thinking, what do people think? Why don't they like me? 
what if I fail? What if I lose it all? The catastrophizing situation. And then the shift of like considering the sharing for the benefit of others, which is what you're doing through your music changes the, you know, it, it stops making it about you, which has a kind of double whammy effect because you get to help other people. And at the same time, you, you get to help yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, I think for me, what I realized was, and maybe it was the same for you, but I just, I literally just got to a point where I just didn't have any energy to live the way I was living. And, um, you know, I, I started seeing a therapist a couple of years ago and he, he challenged my thought process. You know, like I said, I went there to get a cure all and he basically, you know, for me, he told me, you know, this darkness and this, this stuff, this is a part of you. This isn't something that you can just, it's not just going to go away. You're going to have to learn to live with your anxiety and live with your depression and almost embrace it. And as soon as I started to do that, um, even to just give it a name, it started, I start, I, and then, you know, and then through process of, of mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, it just completely has transformed my life. And I, I'm able to deal with those, those problem problematic times, which actually are just less and less, um, nowadays, you know, like I have a really hard time just being away, being away from my family. Um, and it takes a good couple days of just dealing, living in, in my, you know, anxiety, just to get through, to get through that. And, um, I don't know. It just, it's, um, it's, it's easier for me to deal with now. It's still there, you know, it's still there. It's right. always lurking, but now I can, I, I can recognize it and kind of face it head on. And the more I do that, the, the faster I get through it. Yeah. And I think your, word of embracing is what i've been using for years on this podcast it's what i talk about all the time because i think the there's a there's a deep underlying thing which i'm still trying to articulate in words properly but anxiety and or depression being part of us when we push it away and try to not associate with it or try to say there's something wrong with me we're we're pushing away a part of ourselves right it's, yeah absolutely it's rejection internal rejection so i think over time, if you can start to love all of you, um, including, you know, the, the sensitive bits for want of a better term, then I think that's when it starts to become part of the process and you realize that you can flow with it instead of, you know, it's, it's kind of like when people get a liver transplant and their body rejects it because it's not got the right DNA or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you know, like it's the same kind of thing where you have to say, this is mine and I'm going to, I mean, look at, look at what you've done. You've used it in a way to create something beautiful. So from that yeah. dark stuff has come magic, right? Yeah. It's, it's made my story interesting, you know, and, um, and it's just the way I am. It's just the way I am, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's not always easy. And it's like, there's times in the day where you just want it to go away. But, um, you know, it's like, it's just, it, it does make, it does make me more interesting at the end of the day. And it is part of my story. Um, and you know, the, you talked earlier about something about, you know, feeling like a, like a failure or, or something. And, um, I think what it was for me is, you know, kind of, I guess like studying Buddhism and uh, mindfulness meditation, I've realized there really is no such thing as failure. It's just all about, it's all about just these little adventures we go on, on life. And sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't, but, I think that's kind of what, what life is about. You know, it's about trying things and, and, and not succeeding at certain things and succeeding at other things. And, and, um, I mean, you know, there would be no joy without, uh, without, uh, you know, a bit of, a bit of, uh, anxiety and, and fear here and there. Yeah. And I consider the mortality side of it, um, in a positive way and in, in a way to reassure me to, to do things with my life. This morning I dropped my five-year-old off at forest school, which he does. And, oh, cool. um, yeah, he does forest school at the lake here. And I was driving back and that song came on, which is, I don't know the name of the song, but it was like when I was six years old, 
my mother told me that song. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And on the radio and I started getting teary cause I was like, you know, and then it says when I'm 60 years old and it kind of like walks you through your life. Um, yeah. but, and I'm a big softy. So I just started tearing up in the car after dropping my son off. Um, but it made me think like, we got to be fucking bold in our lives. Like we got to make moves and do things because time's ticking. And if you're, you know, driving along coasting and not doing something that, uh, lights you up or not doing something you love or not at least looking for that, then, you know, we're, we're missing it. Yeah. Ain't that the truth? I think, um, a big part of, uh, my recovery, um, was, uh, my brother, who's actually on tour with us right now. He was, um, about just under two years ago was, um, involved in a terrible, uh, really awful car accident. And, you know, it was, I had already lost a brother. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting at his bedside as he's in a coma in Victoria, basically processing this and thinking about my own kids and thinking about my dad and him having to lose another kid. Um, and it really, really kind of pushed my anxiety and depression to, to a breaking point. Um, so much to, to, to the fact that, uh, after, you know, after this, I, after my brother, a visit in the hospital or whatever, I went, I had to go to Chicago to do four nights with, um, Los Lobos in, uh, Chicago and every night was sold out. It was an amazing opportunity. And, um, well, A, on the plane ride back to Alberta from the hospital, uh, I had a panic attack and was trying to get off the plane. And, um, you know, I was, I was in tears and, and, um, thankfully there was, you know, like a little, an angel on the plane that she gave me her aisle seat and, and calmed me down and everything was fine. And I got home, but I couldn't get on the plane, the next plane ride to go to, um, to Chicago. And that's when I realized, you know, I don't want to live my life, um, with this fear of not, of being afraid to actually live. Um, so that's when I really, you know, went to, to get proper therapy and really deal with it. And, and the more I went into my, you know, my therapy and my Buddhist studies and my mindfulness studies, I realized, I, you know, I realized, well, listen, we're all, we're all going to die someday. You know, we don't have it. We don't have any control over that, you know, and people with trauma in their lives, they just want to be able to control everything, right? Because they don't want to have to go through those traumas over and over again. Um, so the more I've realized that, you know, I can't control everything. And the last thing I want to do is live a long life. And at the end of my life, realize that, well, I didn't really live. I didn't take any chances. I didn't really, you know, push, push my, um, my limits. And there was this great thing I was reading. It was a, it was a mindfulness podcast. And she talked about, you know, we go, we walk these little paths in our lives. And when, when we get to the end of the path and it's this big dark forest, we kind of turn around and head back on the well-worn path that we know of this path of comfort. Right. But it's really when we, when we take those extra steps into the dark corners of our lives is where we really get those amazing life experiences. And, um, I could really relate to that, you know, because it's those things in, in, in my life where I, I really kind of pushed aside my fear and I went, I went and did into those dark corners when was really when I really discovered some amazing things about myself or some amazing things about other people or just had some beautiful ex human experiences. And, um, that really resonated with me. And I, I think, uh, I think it's a real testament to, to how, to how we can live our lives with, um, you know, with anxiety and, and just push through it. I think it's really, really important for, especially for, for people like me. Yeah. I, uh, there's a quote I read on, on a bit of information I got, for, I think it was from the album, dream it all away. Is that uh, right? But possibly, the quote said, yeah. Yeah, the quote says, it's weird how the good thing that we sometimes pursue relentlessly because we want it so bad can also be bad for the soul. Ah, the irony of loving it to death and killing ourselves in the process. Stagger couldn't have painted a more complete picture of living the dream. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as you kind of take your hands off the wheel a little bit, let go of the reins is kind of where where life really starts to happen. And, um, I mean, 
you know, it only took me 15 years to realize the things how I, I, you know, how I pictured everything going in my career was it never, it never happened how I, how I pictured it. So, you know, it's easier for me to, you know, concentrate and take responsibility for the art that I make, but I've kind of just don't give as much of a fuck about the anything in between anymore. You know what I mean? Whereas I tried for years to control it and to manipulate it to how I wanted it to be. And that just was exhausting. What's it like? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the trajectory of your career. Cause there's, I feel, and maybe you can clarify, but it feels like you've recently leapt up to another level. I don't know if, if that's cause you've signed a deal or something bigger has happened. You can tell us about that, but, um, some people might be hearing you now and saying, Hey, there's this new guy called Leroy Stagger who's just shown up on the scene, but actually you've been doing this for like, I mean, you released yeah. your first record a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, this, this new record is kind of the one that's really, I guess, putting me on the map. Like it's like, finally there's like cool kids listening to my music now, you know, if that makes any sense, <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, you are the classic, like, Overnight success, 10 years in the making. Or yeah, 15, 15 years, in the years making. exactly. Yeah. 15 years in the making. And, um, I think a little, I think it all is all interconnected to me changing my attitude. You know, um, I decided that, um, you know, all these things in the last couple of years and, and changing, you know, my outlook on my life and the way I carry myself and, and, you know, for it's just, I just decided to give less of a shit of what people think of me and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put, I'll put energy into making the art and writing the music. Um, but I also felt like because I was lighter, my music started to become lighter, um, you know, you know, and less intense and less, uh, insular, and more of like, well, I'm going to find the fucking joy in life if that's if it kills me. You know what I mean? I'm going to find the beauty in here um, instead of just looking through the darkness. And I think since I started to do that. Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of the law of attraction in a lot of ways. Well, then all of a sudden I attracted a really great manager. And the next thing I know, I got offered this great record deal. And I'm making this great record, which, you know um, tied in with this record deal, which now people are really flocking to this, this album. Um, uh, it's good shit. It, yeah, it's, I mean, it is good <laughs> shit, but at the same time, it's just like there, there's, there's a lot of truth in it. There's a little bit of cynicism. Um, but there's a lot of joy in it and, and truth, you know, it's not just a bunch of fluff. Um, which, you know, you turn on the radio nowadays and, and there's very little truth in, in what we're hearing. So when people are hearing this joyful message along with some truth, um, it's refreshing and, and, and people are kind of coming to the party. Um, I think it was just like, well, think about it. What we just talked about, you know, it's like when you're when you picture standing on in stage and feeling like the, the audience is judging you and out to get you. Well, that's going to like, that's going to, that's going to, the, the crowds, the people are going to feel that, you know what I mean? So when, you know, when I made that switch to kind of like bring the people to me as, as instead of pushing them away, I mean, that's kind of, I don't know. It's just now more, now people are coming to the party and uh, I'd never really thought about that before, but that really makes a lot of sense to as to why people want to be at the shows now. People want to buy the record and people want to talk to me um, after the shows and, and before the shows and all that um, is because I, I've, I've dropped that barrier, you know, and it's like I, I want to see I want to hear the stories and, and, and see the beauty in the, in the human condition now. Yeah, and I think to your earlier point, um, I mean, it's it's pretty classic advice in in public speaking circles is to make it try as much as you can to make it about changing or moving somebody in the audience. Don't make it about yourself. Um, yeah, because and I, I think this probably this probably flows over into music as well. But when you do a speech, 
people don't remember what you say. They remember how you made them feel. And I think in music, it's the same thing. People aren't going to remember every lyric the first time they see you in concert, but they're going to remember how they felt even more so in music, I would say. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's this great artist, Michael Fronte, and um, I came to his music a few years ago. He had this record called The Fire, and it was this really intense political record, and it was really cool. It was kind of like this hip-hop rock thing. Um and I really re resonated with the the record, and I loved kind of the little bit of anger to it. And um, and then all of a sudden, he made, started making these like really uber happy kind of pop records, and I couldn't really figure out why. And then I realized, well, he what he's doing is he's bringing everybody to the party, and then he's infiltrating the message in the music to kind of inspire people, as opposed to just get soapboxing or ostracizing people that are different uh, or that are maybe not as politically active. But what he's doing is he's planting these seeds to get people um, active and, and uh, you know, make trying to you know, inspire people to, to, you know, to make humanity better. And I really saw a lot of power in that. And I decided that um, I'm, you know, I'm going to try and do that to my best abilities with the kind of music that I make. Like, obviously I'm not going to make like a super uber happy pop record, but, um, don't you write know, it off. I mean, yeah. Well, you, <laughs> exactly. You never know, but Maybe. that's, you know, I, I want to bring people to the party and then inspire them to be better people, um, through the message. But it's hard to do that when you're just, you know, when you're putting a narrow viewpoint on things or, or hitting people over the head with, with, uh, your message right off the top. Yeah. Or I feel like in the, you know, if you try and too hard to um, create what you think people will want to hear versus like creating your truth for, yeah. for other people to consume, I think are totally different things. Yeah. And my truth is the same, you know, it's pretty much the same truth as a lot of people. We're kind of all in this together, you know, it's like my story is, is different, but, um, you know, our stories are unique to ourselves, but at the end of the day, we're kind of all in this together and we all have a lot of the same fears uh, and anxieties, you know? So I think um, if you put the truth in there that more people are going to resonate with it than just a bunch of fluff. I wanted to ask you about your 15 year overnight success um, from a, like a financial sustainability point of view, were there times in that 15 year where you're like, you know what, I might have to just like stop doing this and, get a normal career. Um, did that, did that come up for you? Yeah. And a lot of it, I mean, it wasn't ever super based on financial, uh, issues, but it was more based on, you know, anxiety and fears of, um, I, I did like when I'm at, when I was having, it uh, about to have a child, um, there was all that fear of, of, uh, you know, that abandonment fear because I, I have those abandonment issues um, from my childhood and I didn't, you know, I didn't, I decided I never wanted my child to feel that, feel that. So I was having all these, you know, anxieties of over that. So I decided to, I worked a couple jobs. Um, then I was working with at risk youth for about a year and then I was started my own furniture company for a while. But, um, you know, when I kind of let go, of, um, my music stuff and, and, you know, I obviously never stop stopped writing music or p playing, but, um, when I stopped kind of worrying about it so much is when it really started to get good and, and start to take off. And, and, um, it just kept pulling me back. And now I can see why, you know, there was, there was a point for me to go and, and help people and, and try to make the world a better place by inspiring people to, um, to take, you know, to so start with themselves. It's really where it comes down to it. it the message is, is learn to love yourself and then, and, and then we can start to love each other, you know, but uh, as far as, you know, f yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of that, that thing of, um, the law of attraction. It's like, if you, do, if you worry about money, you're going to have money problems. And I stopped worrying about money kind of years ago. And, and, you know, I do, I do fine financially. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's, it was never really a financial thing to, to want to stop playing music. Yeah. And I saw like, um, uh, and I'm, we'll have to find out if we can share these. I'm sure we can because I think it's media information. But there's kind of a description of each of the songs on your new uh, record yeah. that you have out now. And the first one, I Want It All, which is probably my favorite one, but that's just because it's at the top on um, yeah. iTunes, so I listen to it the most. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you tell us the the kind of inspiration behind that song? Well, I think there's a couple different things to it. Um, but I think mostly... Um, you know, what this, this whole idea of mindfulness for me was, um, instead of worrying about, uh, what I don't have to actually take stock of what I do have and, and what really matters to me. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, you know, as long as I'm, I have a roof over my head and my, my kids are happy and my wife's happy and, and fed, that's really all the things that I do need, um, so there's a bit of that, and there's also um, it's almost a song about gratitude. Like yeah, it is. is it's a very, cool. it's very much a song about gratitude. Um, uh, you know, and that was just it. I was, I just needed to express my, my gratefulness to, towards my, uh, the wife and kids, and but there's also you know like a little healthy bit of jab of you know a little political jab and and a little bit of healthy dose of cynicism in the song as well. Need a little bit of that in there. Yeah, well, to make things interesting, right? <laughs> yeah, and the and the uh, the the next one was love versus, which talks yeah. a lot about depression and anxiety, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's kind of one of those those songs about uh, dealing with those those negative voices that um, come up. Or maybe that's just me that ha- has those negative voices in my head here and there. <laughs> no, I don't think so. In, you're in good yeah. company, my friend. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's just about kind of silencing, silencing those voices and, and, um, you know, and again, it just kind of comes down to that, that point of just being completely exhausted and of dealing with them to, to the point of going like, why, why am I putting so much energy into caring about this shit when really it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even like, who cares what people think of you at the end of the mm. day? You know what I mean? Are they going to in, in a week? I always started to think about that. Like, is this thing that's bothering me right now going to bother me in three hours or five hours or five days or a week from now? And usually when you say no, it's just like, you can kind of get over it right away. Um, for, for me anyway, um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I just got so exhausted with, with caring about what people think that, um, and then, you know, really studying, uh, I don't know, like faith is a big thing for me. You know, I live in, in, uh, the Bible belt in Alberta and I wasn't grown. I was never raised with any faith or anything like that. Um, but it's kind of become a bit of a, a thing for me, just this discovery and this path. And, and, um, I, I kind of fell in, uh, towards Buddhism mostly. And, uh, just this whole, like this idea of, I don't know, there's something like comforting in this idea of Buddhism that has kind of led me to not give a shit about, <laughs> about what people think. And, uh, I think that, you know, it serves me really, really well. Yeah, and it's just such a, I think of it uh, as like, I think Seth Godin, the marketer, once said that fear is like a bug in our software because it's it's something that served us or anxiety is like a bug in our software. It served us thousands of years ago when we needed to be, we needed to care what people think to stay alive yeah right and to be accepted by the tribe and to be able to eat that night but yeah now with our basic needs predominantly met it's all it becomes is a limiting factor to how big you're going to live your life and with blend that in with a sprinkling of anxiety and, and uncertainty and it ends up meaning that we just play small and 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 think in terms of like if i can just get through today you know um yeah so and that's a, a be- that's a beautiful way to look at it. And sometimes, you know, sometimes we need to just, sometimes we do need to just like, you know, get through today and, uh, that's okay. But, you know, 
Um, those of us that are trying to get better, which most of your listeners would be, I imagine, or else why would they be listening to the podcast? Right. Um, you know, that takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of self discovery, uh, a lot of inward, inward looking and a lot of fear facing, you know, and I don't know, it's not as hard as, as we make it out to be. It's just, it's just, if we, you know, if we want to relieve ourselves of, of those fears and those anxieties, we have to, we have to do the work. Yeah. And there's lots of different ways to do the work, but you know, having that positive way of moving forward and, and striving and, you know, a lot of the things you talked about, like the, there is no cure for anxiety or depression. It's a, it's a case of looking at your life and seeing where you're out of alignment and trying new things and seeing what works for you and seeing what makes you feel good, whether that is faith or whether it's meditation or whether it's nutrition or exercise or friends yeah. or environment. I mean, there's just so many, so many variables in the mix Yeah, uh, that it needs to be a, it needs to be a personal journey. Yeah. Well, it's nice to hear you say that, you know, because I don't know where you're coming from either where, where, you know, but to hear that, to hear you say that, yeah, there's no, there's no cure for it. But there's ways to live with it, you know, and to, to not have it overtake everything. And, and, um, and all those things that you just mentioned are all paramount for me to, to deal with it. You know what I mean? Health, uh, exercise, diet, friends, you know, sometimes just calling the friend list of going, maybe this is not exactly the healthiest person to have in my life. Um, uh, you know, I've had to move on from a lot of friendships because I knew that it wasn't serving um, the way I wanted to live my life, which was, you know, without anxiety uh, as much as possible and, and to move away from depression. And, and the other thing is like, you know, it feels like sometimes society is just set up to 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 hurt us. You know, it's like you turn on the TV and, and it's just fear and you turn on the, the, the open the paper and it's so fear based. When, when in actuality, um, you know, most of our lives, especially in North America, uh, we're pretty safe from a lot of the stuff that we're made to fear. You know what I mean? We've got it pretty good. Um, there's a great Tom Petty song where he quotes, he says, most things I worry about never happen anyway. And that always stuck with me, even before I started to like really get better and go down the healing process. I thought to myself, you know, the things that I crippled myself worrying about, they just never, it never happened. It never came to be. So why am I wasting my energy on these things that never happened? Yeah. And I mean, that's why I don't watch TV or read the news to some extent, but, um, yeah, I see. I mean, the joy I get through my kids is is probably in its purest form. Um, a great way to kind of see see the world and see how you know the simple things are the best things. I, I uh, and actually talking about you know choosing your own path or choosing your own route to recovery. I put a podcast out, episode two hundred nineteen. I just put it out today called "How to Choose Your Own Path to Recovery," and I basically said. Just because somebody on Facebook said they're taking a supplement called 5-HTP or fucking yeah. turmeric or something yeah. doesn't mean it's going to like cure your panic attacks. It just means, you know, s try it and see if it works for you. People now are talking about, you know, CBD oils and marijuana and, and right. uh, MDMA for PTSD and all this stuff. And it's like fine. But that again, that isn't the cure. It's just another potential uh, thing that you could s see how it works for you. I go back to like... You know, I believe fundamentally if a lot of people did choose more carefully the humans they surround themselves with, did fuel their body more effectively from a nutrition point of view and get exercise on a regular basis, you'd have 80% of your problems solved. Yeah, um, I agree too. That's just the foundation of life. That's our yeah. true ancestral community is like nice people, nice nutrition, sunlight, exercise, warmth taken care of right yeah no that's that's a great point um we overcomplicate it sometimes with, with so many choices that it, that creates inaction and procrastination and people are like well until i've read this next book on curing my anxiety i'm not going to start yeah uh, well you just have to pay attention to yourself you know for me i i you know it took me 
30 years to actually like stop and pay attention and go like, well, if I eat this food, how's it going to make me feel? You know, if I don't, if I sit on the couch all day, or if I don't exercise or if I actually go for a walk or go for a run, how do I feel? And like take stock of that. And, and I realized, you know, what works and what doesn't work for me. It's just, you know, there comes a point where we start to have to pay attention to our bodies instead of just, you know, reading it out of a book or, or, uh, you know, I think it's important. We know ourselves better, the best, the best, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just have to, it's, it's hard for people that a don't like themselves to stop and pay attention to them, to their bodies or what they're speaking. And I'm speaking from, from my point of view for a long time. I just, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't love myself. So why would I want to pay attention to what my, you know, what was going on? Um, and until I actually start to really, you know, to love myself for who I am is when I can actually look inward and go, shit, you know, if I, if I don't exercise, I'm going to feel crappy. Or if I eat this donut, it's, you know, I may feel good for five minutes and then I'm going to crash and it's going to be, make me more susceptible to anxiety and depression. So hmm, maybe I shouldn't do that, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, earlier on this week, I had a, a bit of a funk where I was just like, my energy was zero and I just felt drained. Yeah. And, uh, I just, again, as you talked about a moment ago, it's kind of like letting time pass and I know that I'm going to feel better again. So I just kept doing my thing. I kept doing my walks and, um, I couldn't get to the gym yesterday. So I just went outside in front of my house and did some kind of push ups and, thing yeah. to my, my little thing I do to my music, my Tabata thing and went through yeah. that and my, my kids are kind of jumping around and, and then I woke up this morning and I'm good again. Like it's back, but yeah. Um, and it's like, sometimes it's not right away. You know what I mean? It's not a yeah. quick, quick fix, but it sure helps. And the more you do it and it's, you know, I, I tour, so I'm in a van all day long, you know, most days, but it's like, even if I can get out with the guys for half an hour hike or, you know, even a five to 10 minute brisk walk. It's just, I know that, you know, but the old me would have beat myself up and been like, Oh, you're such a loser. You can only do 15 minutes of exercise a day. But me now I'm just like, man, good for you. You got out instead of doing it or instead of sitting there, um, beating yourself up and not doing it. It's like, you just did it. And it does help. You know, those little things do help. You always have a choice, right? Yeah. And sometimes the, sometimes the, the wisdom is choosing not to and then, and not beating yourself up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, no, gen- exactly. the gentleness sometimes. is just as important as, as, you know, saying, right, I got to do the hike. And sometimes if you know yourself well enough, if I know myself well enough and say, well, I'm scheduled to go to the gym today and work out and I'm, and I know that it's not, um, that I'm being lazy. I just, yeah, sometimes I'm not it's feeling just- it. Exactly. That happened to me on Monday. I was like, you know what? I'd been on the road all weekend. I was exhausted. And I said, I'm just going to, I was going to go to the gym. And then I thought, you know what? I need to heal and I'm not going to beat myself up over not going to the gym. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to take care of myself and, and respect that and also give myself credit for, for taking care of myself. And that doesn't mean, you know, I'm going to sit and eat a bunch of junk food. It means right. that I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to literally take care of myself. Yeah, and I go back to this interview I did with a with a great guy, um, Kellen Malad, and he's into Movnat, so he does this, you know, uh, outside climbing mountains and swimming in oceans and kind of exercising with nature, essentially. But he's got he had this I had this beautiful discussion with him one day where he was saying like we demand so much of our bodies, like why am I tired? Why does my leg hurt? Why does my back hurt? Why have I got a headache? And he's like, how often do you flip it around and say how can I give back to my body to like you know, to love it and to make it feel as cared for as possible. And what you did on Monday was saying, you know, this, if it was a machine, um, you, you would want to like, let it cool down and let it, you know, recover. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, Give it a little oil change and yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, um, you know, self care is just, is paramount for people that, you know, people like us that suffer from anxiety and depression, it just, it really is the most important thing we can do is, is to learn how to love ourselves for better or worse and to take care of ourselves. Are there any other daily rituals or weekly things that you do to kind of take care of yourself? 
Yeah, for me now, um, you know, I try to meditate as much as possible, but even even if it's like two minutes a day, um, I go to a group once a week when I'm home that, you know, it's a 30 minute meditation um, and then a 30 minute discussion. And that just, I mean, it's teaching me how to meditate, obviously, but um, meditation is key for me. Um, and uh, there's this thing called meta meditation, which is like love and kindness meditation where um there's like a, you repeat your, you repeat it in the meditation. It says, may you be happy. May you be well, may you be, um, safe and may, you, may you be peaceful and at ease. And you kind of start with yourself and then you think, you know, you start with people that are close to you and somebody that's maybe not, maybe somebody you don't know well at all. And then also somebody that maybe you're having issues with or, try, you know, in, in your life or in your relationships and there's just something about that. Like I really relate to the meta meditation that just really just resets me and brings me back. Um, but for me, you know, like what, you know, like I said, when I'm traveling, it's hard not to, you know, we're at Tim Hortons for at least once a day. Um, it's hard for me not to jam a couple Tim Hortons donuts or, or whatever. But, um, so I drink, you know, I, I try to stay away from that and eat as, as kind of clean as possible. Um, not, you know, I don't, I don't always, but, um, so in a daily ritual, I think a little bit of meditation, um, a little bit of exercise and to eat, eat as healthy as possible. Um, and then, you know, reward yourself with a little treat at least once a day. That's kind of my, my ritual. Sounds good. Normally for me, that's like dark chocolate nighttime. But uh, oh, I wish I could do it. I just can't do dark chocolate. I don't know why. I can't uh-huh. do it. It makes me feel crappy, kind of weirdly enough. Mm. Yeah, but um, I wish. I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah, well, you're still young. I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I quit drinking, uh, I, I really like fell pretty hard into the into the ice cream world. Right. So yeah, but I think. Um, me and my best friend who's in my band, um, he's been sober for eight years as well. I mean, we're kind of like, you know, partners in crime too. When it's like, when we're on the road and it's like, Hey, there, there's a marble slab or something. It's like, you know, so, but as we get older, we're kind of, I said to him yesterday, I said, well, I'm kind of giving myself till I'm 35. And then when I turn 35, like, it's going to be like super clean eating, you know, cut the treats out completely or to like once a week or something but uh we'll see we'll see when i get there yeah see how it goes for sure um so how can people where's the best people to find you to support your music to listen to it um where, where do they go for all that stuff yeah i mean you can find my music on uh you know all the all the music places but um um, but I would suggest checking out my new record. It's called love versus and, um, and see if, if you dig it, you know, but you can go to Leroy com, which is two E's and two G's and, uh, see if I'm in your neck of the woods, uh, anytime soon and, and just come, come say hi. And, uh, you know, if you dig the music, uh, come to a show and, and, uh, say hi. Sounds good, my friend. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And uh, yeah, your willingness to share is exceptional. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. And um, good luck in in your journey. And good luck to all your listeners. And I, I, I end every show by saying, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Good place to leave it. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Tim. Take care, man. There you have it. That was my conversation with Leroy Stagger. I hope you enjoyed it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to share one of Leroy's songs. Uh, this is, as I said in the interview, probably my favorite song, but it could be just because I listen to it the most. So um, this song is kind of with regards to gratitude, as Leroy mentioned, it's called I Want It All. And let's check that out right now.
it's a pretty good life Out into the world of love and strife I'll smile and be happy I told you it was a bloody good song. Uh, so that is my new friend, Leroy Stagger. Uh, I suggest you go to iTunes and get yourself a copy of uh, I Want It All and the rest of that album to support Leroy in his endeavours. His name is spelled L-E-E-R-O-Y-S-T-A-G-G-E-R, Leroy Stagger. And uh, yeah, watch out for this guy. He's coming. Well, he's already he's already going. So Keep following him, but get his music, support him. His website link is in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast as much of I, as much as I have enjoyed making it, please leave us a review on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else you consume this lovely noise. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.